Good afternoon and welcome to all of you. I hope you had a great summer break and that you're eager as we are to start a new cycle of online seminars. My name is Pierre Schlosser. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. And it is a real pleasure for me to introduce and moderate today's online seminar on the SSM approach in tackling NPLs, progress made and challenges ahead. This seminar is the 19th online seminar we're hosting since the school was created. The recordings of all our 19 online seminars are, by the way, available on our webpage. NPLs, non-performing loans, understood as loans on which a borrower doesn't make interest payment or doesn't repay the principal, have been on the policy agenda for quite some time now. NPL ratios have significantly dropped over the last years, yet Europe still displays significant geographic disparities, as we will learn today, on the matter. There's been quite some regulatory and political activity around NPLs in the past years. The SSM has issued its guidance to banks on non-performing loans in March 2017. In July of the same year, the ECOFIN Council has tasked a handful of EU actors to work on the file and come up with new guidelines to, I quote, address the existing stocks of NPLs as well as, the, as, well as the emergence and accumulation of new NPLs on bank balance sheets, in particular in all four following policy areas, supervision, structural reforms of insolvency and debt recovery frameworks, development of secondary markets for distressed assets, and fostering restructuring of the banking system. Ever since the European Commission came out with its March package on NPLs, while the SSM updated its guidance document with an addendum. Today, specifically, we'll hear more about how the SSM has and is approaching NPLs. It is hence a pleasure for me to be in the company today of Ignacio Angeloni, who is a member of the Supervisory Board at the European Central Bank. Welcome, Ignacio. Sharon Finn, who is advisor on credit risk and NPLs at the SSM. Welcome, Sharon. Anna Fröling, who is head of section also at the SSM. Welcome, Anna. And Giuseppe Siani, who is De Deputy Director General for Microprudential Supervision at the SSM. Welcome, Giuseppe. Many thanks to all of you for being with us today. To save some time, I will not give further detail about your professional background. Let me just also there refer our participants to our website where your short buyers are available. Before telling you more about our participants' profile, I'd like to spend just a few minutes to tell you more about our school, as we have several activities in the pipeline which should be of interest to you or your colleagues. Most of you will know by now that the Florence School of Banking and Finance is a non-national and academic platform, which is part of the European University Institute, an intergovernmental research and education institute. The FBF is a place where multiple generations meet to discuss and argue about cutting-edge topics of financial stability, risk management, as well as banking regulation, supervision, and resolution. You may also know that the school boasts a diversity of policy debate and training activities, and that our online seminars are therefore only one of many activities that we run. For example, we just released a few weeks ago our latest ebook, which looks at institutions and the crisis, and can be downloaded for free on our website. Moreover, we'll host two online uh, seminars in October, very soon, on sustainable finance with uh, DJ FISMA on the 9th of October, on bail-in with Wilson Irvin from Credit Suisse, who allegedly coined the term bail-in in the first place, and with Patrick Onwan from the Protestant Institute on the 25th of October. On the training side of things, it is a little surprised that we have been happily training many of you who are attending today, coming from a diversity of organizations and countries. Specifically, we'll be hosting four residential courses over the next months that, given your expertise, could be of interest to you. Next week, we'll have a course on liquidity regulation. In mid-October, from the 17th to the 19th October, we'll have a training course on macroprudential policy implementation with staff from the ESRB and the ECB as instructors. In early November, we'll hold an introductory training session on forecasting in economics and finance. And in late November, lastly, we'll have the second edition of our Autumn School on the Law, Economics and Practice of Banking Resolution. Last but not least, we're finalizing our 2019 training offer as we speak, so let me anticipate to you that we'll have an entire course dedicated to non-performing loans on uh, the 1st to the 3rd of April 2019 with Andrea Resti from Bocconi University. And I think I saw among the participants today Andrea registering, so welcome Andrea. Okay, enough about us, let us talk about you. You, the audience, you're scattered around the world and sitting in front of your screen, however. 
you are around 130 participants, more than 130 actually, uh, participants uh, today. More than 40 nationalities are represented. As always, we have many people from the Single Resolution Board, the ECB, uh, several national central banks. And then we have a diversity of public institutions as well as participants from the private sector. In terms of gender, we have 51% of women, 49% of men, and you have about seven years of professional experience on average. The same majority of you are trained economists, but we also have lawyers and business backgrounds uh, with us today. Lastly, 65% of you have a master's degree, while 26% have a PhD and 9% have a bachelor degree. Right, so time to start. How will our seminar be structured exactly? Uh, well, Ignacio, Sharon, Anne, Anna, and Giuseppe will guide us through the topic of today for about 30 minutes. And in a second step, we'll open up the traditional Q&A session where you guys will step in and write your questions and or comments in the chat box that will appear in due course at the bottom of your screen. Let me stop here uh, and leave the floor to Ignacio and his team in Frankfurt. Can I ask you to please uh, share your camera with the platform? I think you've uh, done that already. And also share the mic. And the floor is yours. I will reappear again for the, for the question and answer. Ignacio, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this very informative introduction. Welcome, everybody, to the European Central Bank, at least in a, in a virtual way. I hope that uh, the audio and uh, the image is clear enough and you can hear me well. We are here in, in my office in the, in the Euro Tower of Frankfurt uh, to present to you the seminar on the action plan that has been put in place by the Single Supervisory Mechanism, the ECB and the national authorities uh, on the non-performing loans. And uh, this is a, has been a major project, as we know, for the SSM in the last few years. Uh, the project was started in 2015, so it's, it's more than three years project now. It has been a major focus of activity and supervisory attention for us uh, uh, in the early years uh, of the SSM. And so it's an important thing, and we are, we are very glad that we had the opportunity today to illustrate its main lines uh, to you. Um, the strategic goal of this project is to free the balance sheets of the banks from the excessive burden of non-performing loans, which has accumulated in the balance sheets of the banks over the previous years uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, partly due to the crisis and partly due to the uh, recession of the economy and partly to other factors that we will explain, uh, and uh, to clean up, therefore, the balance sheets and to do it in a way that is uh, efficient and speedy enough to also to take the opportunity of the favorable economic phase that we are living in now. So to do it as efficiently and as quickly as possible, and at the same time to do it in a cautious way so that the uh, supervisory action does not interfere in an undesirable way with the lending process and with the activity of the banks. And so this is, uh, this is the goal, and we have gone through a number of steps in, uh, first of all, designing this project and uh, putting in place the right amount of information for uh, for conducting this project and then implementing it, and we will in the seminar we will illustrate all these all these different steps. So this is uh, this is basically what I wanted to say. I, I think that uh, it's a good time for us to present this material to you because the design of the project has been completed, the, the, the policy decisions have been made and they have been communicated. We think that uh, these decisions now are well understood by the public and uh, by the banks and by all the stakeholders. And we are now, we have moved squarely to the implementation phase, which of course will continue for some time. We have already seen a lot of progress in cleaning up the balance sheet. That's very important. We will show some data. But we are not at the end of the road, and more progress will have to be made in the implementation phase in the coming months and in the coming years. So, uh, Pierre has already introduced the speakers, and uh, Sharon and Anne will present the bulk of the material. 
uh, to you, and then uh, we will quickly conclude and get your questions, and then perhaps uh, Giuseppe and myself, plus uh, Sharon and Anne, will be able to answer some of your questions. So at this point, if I can properly control the camera, I will move the image to Sharon first. Let me see if I can do that right. Uh, it's moving in the right direction. Here is Sharon to you. <laughs> you can see her. And uh, Sharon, the floor is yours now. Okay, so good afternoon. And as Ignacio said, you're very welcome to this seminar. So now we're going to take you through the presentation material. So I hope everybody can see it on the screen. And I would ask you to direct your attention, please, to um, slide number two. So slide number two is very important because it provides the context. And it really tries to explain to you why there is such a strong supervisory focus on non-performing loans. The chart on the left-hand side of the presentation shows the significant NPL increases um, across the European countries over the period um, 2007 to 2013. And really, when you look at the figures at the end of 2016, you see the situation had not resolved itself in an adequate manner. So really, that's when the SSM um, intensified its work on non-performing loans because of the sheer um, volume of the issue across many different countries. It's also a very important um, discussion point is that the NPL issue in Europe was not solely caused by the economic crisis, but also partly caused by such things as improper credit screening, recognition by banks, inadequate and or delayed provisioning, and also internal governance by banks. And I think this can really be evidenced and highlighted in this chart on the left hand side because it shows the very varied levels of NPLs across the SSM countries. And indeed, if we broke this chart down into further granularity, you would also see that even within countries, there is also very varied NPL levels across banks. And also an important point is that a certain number of the NPLs also predated the financial crisis. So moving on to the bottom side of the, the slide, um, and Ignacio highlighted this in his introductory remarks. Why is there a need to solve the NPL issue? And really, the reason is, is that NPLs, that banks, especially with high levels of NPLs, will face balance sheet constraints. Because this requires banks to hold higher levels of provisions, which affects their income, which affects their profitability, and also can have effect on the liquidity issues. Banks also spend a significant amount of time managing non-performing loans, directing resources in this particular area. And what that does in totality is, is impeding banks doing what they should be doing, which is lending into the real economy, fostering jobs, SMEs, etc. So this really is why we focus in the SSM on such a high level to deal with non-performing loans issue. So that's the introductory slide. I'll now ask you to move to the next slide where we'll talk about the strategy and we'll talk about the journey where we have come from over the last couple of years. When we look at the strategy to resolve and to deal with the NPL issue in Europe, we like to view it under three core pillars. The first one, supervisory actions. And this really is going to form the first part of this presentation and the slides which I will take you through. I will then hand over to my colleague Anne, who will take you through the other pillars, such as legal and judicial reforms, secondary markets, and the wide variety of stakeholder um, activity on this topic at the moment. Moving then on to um, the next slide. What this shows is the activities um, of the SSM's work, and I suppose the journey that we have made over the past number of years. And I suppose that journey for us has had sound outcomes because we have had to find actions. We have taken um, deliberate um, attempts to be as transparent as possible in our supervisory activities. And as part of that, we have published um, on our website a number of really important um, documents uh, and research aspects. So just to take you through um, them in, um, in order. So the first thing that we published was an initial stock take on national practices. 
And really the idea was here is to look at those countries with the highest levels of non-performing loans and think about two things. One was, what have the national competent authorities done in this area? So what good action has been taken? And the second part, which then informs our work and led to us developing the uh, NPL guidance document is, what are the key impediments in each of these countries to resolving the non-performing loan issue? And I think an important message for us to deliver here today is that depending on the country and depending on the individual circumstances, the macro environment, it can have a much different effect on how banks resolve the non-performing loans. And I think this is why we took this initiative to publish the stock take report. Following on from this, we published the NPL guidance. So as we like to call it, the SSM NPL guidance. And we published this in March 2017. And I will talk a little bit more about this particular document in the later slides. The next thing we did was we decided, you know, we had done good work on the stock take and we had focused on a couple of core countries. And we thought it would be very useful to expand that sample and to look at a wide variety of countries. Also countries, for example, that have um, low levels of non-performing loans. So we enhanced the initial stock take and then we published the second stock take to complement the overall work. Following on from that, in this year, in 2018, we have made two um, further publications. Uh, the first one in March 2018, when we published the addendum to the NPL guidance. And also then later, in July, we focused on a press release on supervisory expectations for NPL stock. My colleague Anne will take you through those two later points in later slides. Okay, so let's then get into the substance of the work. I want to spend a little bit of time today to talk to you about the NPL guidance document. So on slide five, what we like to show to you is really the composition of this NPL um, publication. And what it is, what is it? It is a comprehensive document. It's based on best practices. So what we did was we brought together supervisors and experts from many different countries in Europe. We looked at you know, banks with low levels, high levels, medium levels. We looked at existing international best practices, and we brought that together in what we hope it to be a very practical and usable document in which we set out to banks our supervisory expectations on how they should manage effectively their non-performing loans. This document includes a number of core chapters, focusing on all of the real building blocks a bank should have in place in order to be efficient and effective at managing its non-performing loans. The first chapter is the strategies, and I will talk about the strategies in more detail in the next few slides. It also has very detailed sections on governance. Okay? And when we talk about governance, what we, what we mean here is we talk about the level of strategic oversight in, a, in the bank on non-performing loans. Does the bank have sufficient resources to manage its non-performing loans? Does the bank have dedicated expertise in dedicated workout units, for example? We also have chapters on forbearance. So we levered off the existing definition um, under the European Banking Authority regulation. But we complement that by we focusing on the more practical elements of forbearance by trying to promote the concept of sustainability of restructures. The next chapter is recognition, and this is really focused on the EBA um, definition of non-performing loans and where we seek to uh, um, explain in practical manners what that means to banks um, on a day-to-day -day basis. The last chapter is on clash of valuations, and I also have two slides in the later part of the presentation where we can focus on the content there. So that provides an overview of the NPL guidance document. Next few slides are going to focus in on a couple of the, uh, the core topics. Okay, so this is a topic that's particularly close to my heart, um, uh, is the NPL uh, strategies. Okay, and this I think is one of our really the really strong tools that we have, um, where we work with banks uh, to develop their own strategies. So effectively, what is it? It's we ask banks to put together their management boards, their risk functions, their finance functions, all come together, look at their internal capabilities, 
the external environment, and to put together a comprehensive portfolio level reduction plan. These, as I said, are the bank's own plans. And the idea is to reduce in a meaningful manner the level of non-performing loans and foreclosed assets. Then we have the joint super supervisory teams who work here in the SSM who deal with the banks on a day-to-day -day basis. So the banks submit their plans and then the JSTs, supported by a central team, challenge, review, engage with the banks to really understand the substance of the strategies and really understand are they ambitious, but also, as important, are they realistic? Are they credible? And really, it's about making sure we're fostering that positive and effective supervisory engagement with the banks on a bank by bank basis. So as on foot of that, we actively monitor banks in terms of their progress. And we don't just look at the overall results. What we like to focus on is also the substance of the matter, which is where we focus on how banks are reducing because this then indicates their future capabilities in order to deliver future strategies. And this is also a very core component of our work. Moving on then to slide seven, I want you to spend a little bit of time today just talking to you about how do we, uh, from a practical perspective, um, look at the ambition level um, of the strategies and how do we really um, assess these strategies. So we've highlighted today a few of the core concepts we would like to share with you. So I think the first thing to say, and it's very important for us here, that we are facilitating as much as a level playing field as is possible, but also recognizing the importance that every bank is different. And every bank, even if it's located in the same country as other banks with similar issues, will have different compositions of portfolios, will have different risk profiles, and that is why it's very important for us to work closely with the JSTs to make sure that that bank by bank approach is taken. So what we do is, of course, we look at MPL ratios. These are a very important key indicator that we track and we have published a lot of data in this area. But when we look at ambition um, and also to highlight back to the point at the start of the presentation is that we don't have all banks starting from the same point. We have banks with very varied levels of non-performing loans. So in order to create as much a level playing field as possible, what we do is that we measure ambition based on the volumes of reduction. So the gross and net volumes. So we look at the starting point at a particular period and we say, what is the total volume of non-performing assets and, and um, non-performing loans of foreclosed assets? And then we project forward three years based on the bank's own plans. And we look at that, what does that mean? in terms of effort. We also assess how diversified, for example, the strategies are. So here in the SSM, and as you can see, based on the NPL guidance, we don't just favor one particular reduction option. It's very important for us that banks are using all the options available to them. And again, there is many options, such as working out loans, forbearance, write-off, sale, or closing. So again, we would encourage banks to have as much of a diversified strategy as possible in order to be able to maximize the results. We look at the strategies over a three-year horizon. And this, again, goes back to our publicly um, communicated position is that you know, we recognize that NPLs cannot be solved overnight. This takes deliberate and determined action by banks, but it's very important to recognize that progress will be made over the medium term and in some cases over the longer term. So to try and accommodate and to try and recognize this reality, we look at the strategies over a three-year horizon, obviously focusing, of course, on the yearly um, position. And in addition to that, ambition for us, when you look at individual banks, as well as most data analysis, we try to do some sort of benchmarking, assessing against comparative peers, looking at the country position, looking at the SSM position, Again, trying to inform ourselves, trying to provide context, and to ensure that we are as um, efficient in our analysis as we possibly can. So then, the next two slides focus on collateral. And uh, we just wanted to kind of highlight to you just very briefly um, the collateral valuation uh, topic. 
So what we've included um, on this slide number eight is a snapshot from the published SSM Annual Supervisory Priorities Report from 2017. Just to highlight to you that as part of our ongoing work, which also includes very detailed on-site inspections, we look at the topic of collateral valuations. And based on our work, based on on-site inspections, we still see in some instances uh, issues in terms of how collateral valuations are um, calibrated, how they're performed, and we wanted to share with you just some insights um, in that regard. So things like collateral haircuts, for example. So what is the actual cost, the loss that a bank may take on a particular collateral if it's selling it or executing it in a particular market? The discount times, the cure rates, so how long is it taking banks to sell properties? And also then the cure rates in terms of returning non-performing loans to performing. So these are some of the topics that is very much uh, in our focus and aspects that inform and further develop our NPL work in the implementation period um, that we're now in. So moving then on to slide nine, in the NPL guidance document, we have a very important chapter dedicated to collateral valuations. And we wanted to share with you on this slide some of the key messages. So let's focus, for example, on a very simple topic like policies and procedures. So something that's very important to us that we have recognized and found maybe as part of our analysis is that the board of a bank, the management body, should have a very strong involvement in the setting of collateral policies. Because collateral valuation is probably one of the key inputs into the provisioning calculations. And such, it's very important that we have accuracy of the collateral valuation but also that the underlying assumptions, the adjustments that are made to the class evaluations are actually fit for purpose. We also expect the banks to have a regular review cycle for collateral evaluations so that if there is increased risk, this then can be represented in a meaningful way as part of the bank's um, strategy, also as part of the bank's provisioning policy, um, etc. We also expect and would really uh, highlight the importance of a strong monitoring and quality control approach. So robust processes, regular challenge evaluations, and also, not to be underestimated, IT capabilities. To have strong databases for transactions, for collateral, and have common sources and definitional basis. These are really simple but important aspects that can really support a bank's effective approach to how it manages its collateral and its collateral valuation. Okay, so then that's uh, for me. We've covered the main body of the of the presentation in terms of supervisory engagement. Um, we would like to hand over to my colleague Anne, who will take you through the rest of the presentation. Hello everyone, also from myself, um, and thanks Sharon for, for handing over and explaining the, the guidance so fully. I think it's a good starting point. Um, the NPL guidance, the NPL guidance uh, was issued in March of 2017. And in the process of putting up the guidance, we had interacted with a lot of the, the peers uh, across Europe, but also internationally, and collected best practice. And this best practice has then been put into this qualitative guidance. We also saw, um, when we collected the best practice, we saw some quantitative best practice that had worked well for some countries. And we had considered this for a while, and we then received, after the, the main guidance was published, we received the mandate from the supervisory board of the ECB to look into whether we could also add some quantitative elements to the guidance. We did this um, about a year ago when we published the so-called addendum to the, to the NPL guidance. The addendum initially in its consultation phase covered this exactly what I mentioned, the practice we, we had seen in some countries and that had worked well um, with the aim for new NPLs in the future to get higher coverage for aged NPLs, because that's one of the issues Sharon just mentioned that we had seen as, a, as an issue. When we went through the consultation, we received a lot of feedback, a lot of, a lot of very valuable feedback. Um, it took us a couple of months to integrate the feedback. And finally, we came out in March of this year, 2018, 
published the NPL addendum, which applies for new NPLs as of the 1st of April of 2018. And it's valid only for significant institutions. So that's about 120 large uh, institutions in the, in the euro area that we supervise directly. The content is that we would like banks in the future, as a, as a non-binding guidance, um, to try and cover unsecured elements of non-performing loans with 100% after about two years um, in, in the NPL status. And for secured elements of, of non-performing loans, uh, we would like 100% coverage after about seven years in NPL status. Now, as mentioned, exactly like the main guidance, this addendum is, is non-binding. It serves as a starting point for our supervisory teams to interact with the banks to, to then apply it case by case and see how it and, and where it works and where it might not work. Um, the one question we had a lot is on the secured elements and, and, and what is this based on? The secured expectation and, and the request or the, the proposal or recommendation we have to try and cover it fully after seven years is linked to the fact that from a prudential perspective, if you cannot enforce a collateral, Within a, a timely in a timely manner, um, it's not very useful as a credit risk protection. So that's been the underlying the underlying reason for also including secured exposures. And finally, just to reiterate and, and to make sure there are no misunderstandings, if there's a deviation from this expectation, there is not any direct consequence for a bank. It's always subject to an individual discussion with banks. Um, case by case decisions, discussions, um, looking at data of the banks. So um, I don't think uh, you can, there's, there's any macro prudential conclusions that can be taken from this. So let's move on to, so this is new NPLs. And when we brought this addendum out to the market, we got a lot of questions. Well, yes, this is a good idea, but we still have a significant stock of NPLs. So what about this? So to start this discussion, um, we've put down here just the, the pure numbers of how have NPLs evolved over the time frame of the SSM actually supervising. So we came in at the end of 2014 and started to supervise the 120 largest or, or, or most significant banks um, in the euro area directly. And we had a stock of about 1 billion within NPLs within these significant institutions. If you look at the latest numbers, and the data is from our ECB supervisory banking statistics, we publish them quarterly. They are all transparent and online. You can also see them by country, by the way. Um, it has come down quite significantly. So the progress is good. So we are generally happy with the progress. However, again, if you look at the numbers and if you look at the NPR gross ratio that's also displayed here, we have just dropped below 5%, but this is still too high as an average NPL ratio. So this is why further efforts are needed, even though undoubtedly there has been good progress, also thanks to the supervisory actions. But we should be modest here because there have been a lot of other actions as well in the market um, by national and European authorities. We'll go into the, the details a little bit later as well on this. At the same time, and this was one of the issues we had at the very beginning when we started the work, um, people were concerned about potential impacts on, on lending and recovery of the economy. If we're looking at the data now, we don't see any evidence that, that there has been a negative impact. So all in all, we believe the, the comprehensive supervisory package we've put together has started to work in a very positive way. However, we still have that issue I mentioned on the 4.8% on the NPR ratio across the euro area significant institutions. Based on this, um, we had internal reflections on how to best address the issue. And um, the supervisory board of the ECB had decided earlier this year that we would go about NPL stocks in a case-by-case -case way when it comes to provision coverage um, expectations. So that was announced by us on the 11th of July. The aim of this announcement is, first of all, in the medium term to receive a similar coverage approach to NPL stock and NPL flows. Um, but at the same, same time, to be very aware of bank-specific situations, of, of the impact of the financial features of the individual banks. So what will happen is that our joint supervisory teams will interact with individual banks in the near future to discuss and define adequate case-by-case -case supervisory expectations. So besides this, further next steps, following up on, on what Sharon has presented, 
The GSTs will, of course, also continue to closely work and review the NPL frameworks of the banks to make sure they are in the spirit of the NPL guidance uh, we have released and also continue to closely challenge the NPL strategies of high NPL banks. And we're using a number of internal tools to make this consistent and, and level playing field. So as a wrap up, um, we think a lot of progress has been made. We also think that our supervisory tools have been very useful to, to support this progress. However, we also have to, of course, put a disclaimer that this is not only due to supervisory actions. So there have been a lot of other initiatives, most notably um, the EU Council Action Plan that was issued in July of last year, which involved actions for a large number of different stakeholders um, across the EU to address the NPL issue. We are, as an ECB, as ECB, closely involved in all these um, initiatives and also very strongly support them. And we have included just a quick overview of this, just for completeness, on the next slide. So what are the elements that the Council had proposed to address in a broader picture to address the, the issues of NPL across um, Europe? And um, the elements on supervision, they, to a large extent, go also beyond our own powers. So um, what was included was a proposal that the Commission should consider prudent uh, provisioning backstops also in the Pillar 1 context. This is work ongoing. The Commission has published in March of this year their proposal for this in, in the NPL package of 14th of March. And furthermore, there has been a request to the ECB to implement guidance also for less significant institutions. And the EDA was asked to issue guidelines on, on loan origination and also to extend the ECB guidelines to all EU banks. This is work ongoing. Then the second block you see on the slide 14 is the macroprudential pr perspective. So ESRB was asked to look into approaches on how to prevent any NPL problems, system-wide NPL problems in the future. Again, it's work ongoing. I think the deadline is end of this year for the ESRB to present this. Then another element to the macroprudential solutions was um, a blueprint for ANCs, so for national bad banks. The Commission developed the blueprint together with other stakeholders, including the ECB, and it was published also in the NPL package of the 14th of March of this year. Then we move on to the secondary market proposals and solutions. First of all, um, the EBA was asked to enhance the disclosure requirement, which is work ongoing and also to strengthen uh, the data infrastructure together with some other stakeholders. This is work ongoing. To consider NPL transaction platforms, again, work ongoing, um, active discussions here. And finally, to remove any impediments to um, the transfer of non-performing loans. There has been a proposed <coughs> directive in the 14th of March NPL package of the Commission on this topic. Then the final block, the insolvency frameworks, the Commission had worked on a benchmarking on this, um, looking into the national loan enforcement regimes. So the Council Action Plan proposed to publish the results of this benchmark <coughs> as soon as possible. And they also asked to consider, for member states, to consider a peer review of national insolvency regimes. And finally, um, there was a question to analyze the possibility to enhance the protection of secured creditors. This has also been a part of the directive proposed by the Commission on the 14th of March. So as you see, there are a number of initiatives. They, a lot of them are still work in progress, but we expect them to close in the upcoming month, and which will then lead us to a phase where, where we can start implementing and, and um, bearing the fruits of all of that, that good work. So with this, I would like to close um, and thank you all for your attention. And we are open for any questions you might have. Well, there's there's not much more for me to say by way of conclusion. You've heard, uh, you've had a lot of information. I, I, th I think one, one important thing that um, the presentation has conveyed is that this has been at least as much a work on exposures, on uh, NPL specifics on collateral, etc., as it has been a work on 
dealing with the internal governance of the banks and their mind frame and, uh, and, and building up alertness uh, by the banks of the existence of NPL, first of all, collecting the right information, uh, uh, elaborating strategies, uh, making the decision-making bodies of the banks aware and alert, uh, creating the right expertise, etc. So this, uh, there's, there's been a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, good practice building uh, in in uh, which is which is i think to some extent can also affect uh, in a positive way other areas of of of, of the banks and and we are encouraged by the fact that um, now we think that the mind frame of the bank, many banks have, has changed uh, they are much more alert they take the initiative and now that we've moved to the implementation phase there's not i think much more need for us to be on the stimulus side or to be on the pushing side because they are aware of the problem and they are very much autonomous in the way they, they deal with their NPLs. So we are encouraged not only by the numbers that we have seen, that the progress that is being made, it's very fast, it's really unprecedented, uh, the progress that is being made, but we are also confident that this uh, progress okay. will continue. Excellent. Yeah, we, we already have, have questions, yes. so I, I was about to thank you all for your for your uh, presentations, but I think that we can jump straight into the questions. Uh, you will see that they're written in the chat box. Uh, we have one very long and one very short. Uh, we could start, I mean, we could start with Lorenzo, who has who's been conducted uh, a, a project on um, restructuring, uh, but we could also start with a question by Carlis, um, as you prefer. So the question by Carlis is about introducing mandatory NPL write-off rules. Um, she's claiming that it's been successful in some other countries to bring NPL, NPLs down rapidly. Would you like to comment on this one? So good afternoon. Maybe I can start with the second one, which is shorter, of course. Uh, good afternoon also from uh, myself here in Frankfurt. The question is whether we have considered introducing mandatory NPL write-off rules. Uh, uh, we are acknowledge that there has been some experience around the world, but we have always focused on a sort of pillar two type of uh, uh, provisions. So uh, we do not believe that uh, the application of mandatory NPL write-off would be fully consistent with our overall strategy that, as it was uh, described before, is uh, always, always been considered as a sort of package. So our overall strategy aims really to um, give banks the full toolkit to tackle this issue, like, uh, like the two colleagues, uh, Sharon and, and um, have, have, uh, have clarified during the presentation. On, on the first one, I don't know whether maybe Sharon you want to, to start. Mm -hmm. so, the first one. Still reading very well. Um, okay. So I, this is focused, as I think, on the commission um, proposal. Um, so again, you know, we are not representing the Commission here today. We're, um, the objective of the presentation, I suppose, is to explain to you the supervisory approach. Um, and I think so. I think we would prefer to focus on you know that work and how we then put that work together. Um, I, I do agree with you. It's important. You know, we do have um, a lot of um, viable um, SMEs um, in the euro area, and I tried to touch on it a little bit earlier. Um, we focus on this particular topic in a, and it also goes back to what Ignacio says in terms of governance. Okay, so what we ask for in the NPL guidance is that we ask the banks to have dedicated NPL workout teams in place. So, for example, taking your question and looking at SMEs, for example, SMEs have a particular risk profile. SMEs have are involved in many different sectors. So a bank should have sufficient expertise, but also resources in place within the structure of the NPL unit to be able to get to the NPLs of the SMEs in a efficient, but also a very quick manner. Also, for example, a restructuring arrangement for a SME involved in a retail business, for example, is a lot different to an SME that's involved in like a pharmacy or involved in um, some sort of hospitality industry. They represent different types of um, borrowers, but also they have different um, balance sheets, P&L turnovers, cash flow requirements. So if a bank is able to put in dedicated resources, have the tools to effectively manage those NPLs, 
what we ask in the guidance is that there's that they understand and get to quickly which ones are the viable ones and which ones aren't the viable ones. Because, for example, if you left, if an SPME goes into difficulty and it misses a 30-day payment, a 60-day payment, the quicker the bank gets to that SME, right, the quicker it offers restructuring arrangements, maybe cash flow, additional working capital facilities, this can really impact on the viability of the SME. Because if the SME has the restructuring, has the, the necessary funds available to it, it can then pay all its suppliers. It can then address all of its issues and it maintains that viable status and isn't left to kind of deteriorate, et cetera, which then, which refers to your question, has provisioning implications. So that's kind of a, a, a twist on your question to show how the practical elements of the MPL guidance link in with viable borrowers, restructuring, and then obviously the associated um, provisioning. Okay, thank you, Sean. Uh, perhaps Lorenzo, if you're interested yeah, in sharing the the results of your of your research project since it was you funded, you can also you can feel free to to share it in the in the chat box. There were new questions, unless Ignacio, you wanted to complement. No, no, I'm reading, uh, and it's not easy because the font is small. But there's one there's there's one. Uh, question that refers to a research, and I'm reading that show that would show that the NPLs have been reduced by the banks that had well, the stock of the NPL were well, low. Well, low. I'm surprised by this because I, I what I have in mind is exactly the opposite, but I see that uh, Anne is uh, moving her head in this approval, so let me, let me give her the floor immediately. Okay, thanks for this. I haven't uh, read the study, so I'd be interested to have a look, but um, we don't publish bank by bank data, but what we publish, as I mentioned before, is the quarterly supervisory statistics. And a couple of countries um, have high NPL ratios, and most of these uh, have high NPL ratios across the market, so you don't even need a bank by bank view. But if you look at these supervisory statistics, you'll find that those high NPL countries have done partially some quite significant reductions, maybe with one or two exceptions. Um, over the past year, so I'd say, from our perspective, this is not uh, fully correct. Not only that, but I mean, if we look at the recent progress that we have seen, you hear me? Yes, we do, we do. You don't see my face, so, but, no, no, I was just going to say, if you look at the country by country data, not only you've, we've seen a reduction in the average NPR ratios, both gross and net, but also a convergence. Uh, across countries. So this means that the countries that had the higher ratios have been moving down more. Uh, and that is true, that is true, I think, uh, at the level of countries and at the level of banks. So we are encouraged by that as well. Let's yes. move to the next one. The next one is Andrea Resti. When introducing the quantitative similar tools have been, yes, sorry, I'm no. reading, uh, successfully developed in some European jurisdictions. Could you be more specific on this and provide a reference to the rules? Sorry, it has moved off. I cannot read it anymore. It has moved Shall I read it? Screen. When introducing the quantitative addendum to the ECB NPL guidelines, you mentioned the fact that similar tools had been successfully deployed in some European jurisdictions. Could you be more specific on this and provide references? to rules requesting calendar-based provisions across the NPL portfolio, in parentheses, as opposed to rules limited to specific loan types. Your help would be appreciated. It's basically the, 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 the comparison with other uh, similar initiatives undertaken yeah. in other countries. This is the bubble. So, and I can do something very quickly. Um, there are some age World Bank reports where you can look at this. So, so there are analysis. I can name countries like these things are used in the US. They have been used in Japan. Spain has used them. So I think you find, if you look, you find examples across the globe, actually, where this, where this has worked well. So there's a, a, another question here in terms of um, preventative yeah. side. And I think that's something I think we can uh, share something. Uh, uh, this is a, a particular. Um, do you want to move this? Mm -hmm. sorry, <laughs> sorry. Oh yes, I'm not very good at movie direct. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. So on the preventive side, 
because you know we do agree here you know we there is both on the bank side and on the supervisor side you know we spend so much time trying to deal with the non-performing loans it's quite resource intensive so naturally you know what have we learned from the past and what are we going to do for the future to try and I suppose we're never going to prevent it it's more trying to reduce it or trying to mitigate its effects etc so one thing which is Anne has as 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 highlighted to you is is the addendum because you know if this is focused on new non-performing loans so in again it's trying to re reinforce this message that banks should take a proactive approach to non-performing loans trying then to go back to the overall credit risk framework in a bank and trying to get back to the source at the origination so if there is going to be supervisory expectations on new performing loans possibly that could influence in a positive way the type of lending banks are doing at the first instance in addition to this we also have i first nine um, which comes in from an account which is in from an accountancy perspective where banks you know should be um not just waiting for the loss to take effect but take the position that at some point there will be some loss you know we are it's an expected situation so therefore reinforcing this in the underlying credit framework and then Anne also um, mentioned as part of the EU action plan there is work ongoing uh, by the European Banking Authority on the um, loan origination guidelines okay so this is going to try and focus on best practices um, and on aspects that can help at the start of the process so really when the loans are being granted in the first place you know what are the kind of criteria the sensitivity analysis you know what is the underlying risk um, of those loans and how then is that integrated into the bank so I think it's an excellent question and something that's very very topical and, and, and very useful maybe I would like also to add that uh, what has been uh, very very helpful is really to increase the focus on the governance part mm. It was also by combining the work of the JST and on-site inspections that we have seen that in some banks that there was not enough consideration given to the you know, proper internal governance allocation task responsibility. It might look like a sort of a qualitative statement, but when you apply that in a concrete terms on the field, you realize that the banks really are following that indication. With also the second order positive effect that I also we have seen some improvement also on the quality of data. Because by focusing on internal governance, this has also helped to have a much more consideration to the data quality uh, that banks have uh, developed. And see, this is indeed uh, has helped internally also to uh, monitor the, um, the classification, sure. but also the granting of new loans. So I think that also this is something that we have uh, seen uh, with, uh, with a lot of uh, pleasure, I would say, because this is, was uh, a, a good uh, supervisory um, uh, measure to implement. There is one, one question on insolvency law. That's obviously out of our territory um, because we are not legislators, but uh, the Commission, that, that's part of the action plan of the Council and the Commission is working on it. And I'm, I'm aware that uh, in particular the DG FISMA and the DG Justice in the Commission have been actively working together on um, examining the state of affairs in terms of insolvency laws in the member states and, and see what type of action can be undertaken to harmonize and to and to strengthen those frameworks. Uh, I, I, I don't think it would be uh, all that appropriate for us as ECB to explain what the Commission is doing. We, we know what the, what the Council has asked them to do. We know that work is in progress and so I, I would suggest that this is uh, if anything, this is this question is then addressed to the to the commission. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you want to say no, something no. about it, but I, I think that would be. We know the general lines so, and the direction they want to move to, but uh, this is not work that is undertaken sure. by these. Okay, uh, thank you. So there was a question by Juan Ayora, who is saying, "What does it mean that it is necessary to clarify the supervisory powers as regards the NPLs? Could you please elaborate more on this?" Yes. Just let me move. And do you want to take this? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, no, no. <laughs> Again, I have to take a course on this. Yes. 
So the first action point in the Council Action Points of July of last year that has been published was uh, a request to the Commission to clarify that um, what we are doing with the addendum is actually within our powers, and that has happened. So it's as simple as that. Anyone there? Yeah. Yes, well, as it was... As it was explained, what we do is in the context of the so-called Pillar 2 chapter of supervision. In the meantime, the Commission and the legislators have been active on the Pillar 1 side and the two complement each other um, from the point of view of the action on the NTS. Um, are we going to the next? Uh, There's the next one, yeah, yes. so far. Uh, Andrea. Andrea Zorzi. Connecting to Lorenzo's question, don't you think that requiring a cure period of one year for the NT for born in order to exit the NT status is, is too long when the debtor has gone through a court confirmed restriction? Aha, that's an interesting one. Do you want to take it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so uh, time flies. So we'll take a few more. And yeah, so, please, okay, Sharon. So, okay. Yeah. So just quickly, just to it's an interesting question. Uh, just to put maybe uh, some perspective on it. So we've talked a lot today about you know we have um, very varied NPL levels. We have very varied insolvency arrangements. We have very varied legal systems, but we do have one big, very strong benefit, and that is we have a common definition of non-performing and for born that we get from the European Banking Authority um, uh, regulation. And this is a huge benefit that we have um, across, across Europe because this allows us to have the same expectations. It allows us to monitor banks in a meaningful and consistent way. And, you know, if you go back to the whole idea of the probation period, so this one year period, it's, you know, it is useful and has been proven useful because what it does, it allows the bank uh, to understand if the borrower can make the repayments. So again, there's always risk here. And even if there is an out of court uh, restructuring, you know, that out of court restructuring is probably based on, you know, the available income of the borrower and its ability to make repayments on an ongoing basis. Having a certain consistent length of probationary period allows there to be comfort that the borrower actually can make these repayments, that it can satisfy its obligations. And it generally, what the objective is, that it removes the unlikeliness to pay. So I think the consistent definition is one of our most material benefits that we have in an environment where we have many different um, countries. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. okay, there was a last, very last question. So uh, if you it? still have a few, two or three minutes ah. left, is that okay? Okay. Yes. The last one, we, I read it, but it's not all that clear to me. What is the distribution of NPLs and the importance of adopting a granular approach? Yeah, I think you have you had a graph on the on the geographic distribution, uh, but oh. I think on the graph uh, didn't feature the. A sectoral distribution. I don't know if you have you have figures to share on that, or if you'd like to to pick it up from there. So, so yeah. So, and you're rightly so. So, this is this total stock, and within the total stock, you have um, you know, mortgages, you have commercial real estate, you have SMEs, you have corporates. Um, different countries have different compositions of those. Even different banks have different compositions. And um, the importance of the, just to give you an insight, the importance of the granular approach is, is important both for banks, but also for us, because how you restructure a commercial real estate deal, how you manage a commercial real estate deal is much more different, is much different to how you do, how you would manage a residential real estate. So granularity, the key, the devil, you know, it, the, you need the detail and banks need the detail in order to really effectively manage their their, their, their situation. So I don't know. I know and I think that this is indeed one of the key strengths of this case-by-case uh, -case approach that helps uh, the JST, both the JST and the banks to go into the details and uh, consider the portfolio specificity, like uh, Sharon said. So that's why it's very counterintuitive from our perspective to apply any ex-ante predetermined type of approach. So it's absolutely important to go into the details with mm -hmm. banks as part of the supervisory dialogue and try to find uh, the right answer to the 
to the portfolio specificities. Okay. Any closing remarks from your side? Anything that you wanted to add and that hasn't been touched on? Okay. Not from me, Pierre. I thought it was a very interesting okay. discussion. Excellent. Thank you. So the seminar is, is really at its end now. I hope you, you enjoyed it as much as, as we did. I'd like to warmly thank our speakers for their time and, and dedication, uh, including all the staff that has been involved for the preparation. As I mentioned earlier, we'll have two online seminars in October, on 9 October on sustainable finance and on the 25th of October on, on bail-in. So stay tuned. And again, thank you for, for watching. Goodbye.